Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to those of you that braved the cold today and came out in person, and welcome to all of you who are joining us online this morning. It is good for us to be able to uh, be together again and be able to uh, worship the Lord. A couple of announcements. Most of these announcements are in on the web page, you can click on online worship, and below that you'll see an announcement page. You can get most of these there, um, but there's one that's not on there that I'll bring up in a second. But the ones that are, uh, there is Bible study, uh, 9 o'clock. You can be either in person or you can join us on Zoom. The Zoom connection number is on there as well. So feel free, if you didn't get a chance to join us today, to join us for that. And then Wednesday, same Zoom meeting, um, but not in person, just an online prayer and small group time. Uh, again, one of our deacons helps write questions up for us based on the sermon that we talk about today. We'll be talking about that on Wednesday, so feel free to join us for that. Uh, moving down a little ways on the list, the vulnerable persons worship area. Right now, we've all been meeting in here and we've got plenty of space for us, um, but we want to allow uh, the space next door in the old sanctuary to open back up again. We've got about 25 well-spaced seats over there. And the main difference between there and here is that we uh, temperature check all of us who are uh, on the platform and stuff in the morning when we come in, but we don't check everybody. There, we check everybody for temperatures. And here, if you uh, have a mask, but you really struggle with wearing it and you need to pull it down for a little bit, we say, you know, hey, not a big deal, that's fine. Um, but there, it's got to be on all the time. So if you have a, a medical condition where you can't wear it or something like that, this would be the room for you rather than that one. And that one's going to be opening up again next week and will be open through Easter. Um, and that way, folks who want to start coming back out again but are still a little hesitant uh, have an even safer area than here, which has been pretty safe up to this point, um, but have an even safer area there that they can come to. So if you're watching online and you're thinking, when can I start coming out if I'm a little bit hesitant, uh, that opens next week. So you could come back as soon as next week and be over there. And basically what we do is we live stream everything that happens in here, there. So the biggest difference between watching at home and watching there is you actually get to be with other people. And for a lot of us, I know that that's been something we've been looking forward to and something we've appreciated being able to do. Um, Related also to COVID, and this is the one that's not in the announcement page, so listen carefully to this one. Um, there will be this Saturday, the 20th, at 2 p.m., using the same Zoom call information that's for the Bible studies on Sunday and Wednesday, a Zoom call for anyone in the church who would like to participate. Uh, we are going to have uh, Dr. Matt Lee go through a bit of a presentation for us regarding the vaccines and talking about what they are, how they work, all that sort of good stuff. Uh, so if you have any questions regarding that, this would be a really good Zoom meeting to attend. So again, it's not in your announcement sheet, so you may want to write this down. It's going to be this Saturday, the 20th, and it's going to be at 2 p.m., using the Zoom information that's here. And tomorrow we'll get a, a note up on the website that'll highlight that information again so everybody has it. Oh, great question. Uh, the question is, will that be recorded? And the answer to that will be yes. Uh, we try for the all church things to record them just so that we have a record of what we said if we need to go back and look at it. So yeah, if you don't get a chance to watch it live, let us know. We can get you the link to the recording. I believe that is the extent of the announcements for this morning. Let's turn to the call to worship. In terms of what we're talking about today, we're talking about faith and the way it lives itself out in what we do. And so for the call to worship this morning, we're going to the book of Hebrews. Chapter 11 is known as the, the faith chapter, and it lists a bunch of people who lived by faith and did things because of that. And I'm going to read 8 through 16 for the call to worship, and then uh, verse 17 will come up as we uh, get into the sermon for this morning. So, Hebrews 11, starting with verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, 
not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. He was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Let's take a moment and pray. Heavenly Father, as we hear of the faith that drove people to go and do and be things that they never would have imagined they could do, we're reminded that faith is powerful. Not so much because of our faith, but because of the one whom we have faith in. And so, Lord, we look to you even this morning and trust that much in the same way as we are our pilgrims, as we are exiles, as we are journeyers through this land, that we are coming to you. And that there is a, a better city, a better land, a better country for us. And that is in your presence forever. And so we pray, Lord, that you would help us to get even this morning a little glimpse of what that looks like. That we would be able to rejoice in the, the presence that we have with you now. Lord, we pray by your spirit you would be working in and through our gathering today. That we would be able to, to celebrate the goodness of your presence. And Lord, that we would, like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Sarah and so many others, continue to press on in faith to do the things that you have called us to do. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. Excuse me, my earrings all caught in here. Uh, this week, we want to spotlight uh, Charles Octavius Booth. He was born June 13th, 1845, as an enslaved person in Mobile, Alabama. Even though it was illegal at the time, he taught himself how to read and write beginning at the age of three by reading Ten Pie Pans. Booth grew up in the African American Baptist Church, but did not profess his faith until after he was a freed man in 1866. By 1868, he became an ordained pastor and began his lifelong ministry work. 
Reverend Booth used his passion for reading and learning to teach other newly freed black people in the South so that they too could flourish. He believed that education was the key to dispel the false notion back then that black people were just ignorant savages. His more well-known accomplishments include teaching at the Freedmen's Bureau, establishing the Colored Baptist Missionary Convention for Alabama, founding Selma University, an HBCU that is still around today and that focuses on training black ministers. He launched uh, and pastored two churches at the time, First Colored Baptist in Meridian, Mississippi, and later Dexter Avenue Baptist in Montgomery, Illinois, uh, Alabama. Uh, and so the history with Dexter Avenue is that Martin Luther King Jr. went on to pastor that same church from 1954 to 1960. He also wrote the Cyclopedia of the Colored Baptists of Alabama, which served to uplift and encourage black Christians within the Baptist denomination. But his most notable work to date, like the video reference, is the book Plain Theology for Plain People. Booth wanted to offer a book that broke down what the Christian faith is in a way that the common man could understand. He believed that each person deserved the right to hear the whole gospel rather than the skewed version that many heard while they were enslaved. The book sought to af affirm, encourage, and uplift those who were downtrodden and belittled. It pointed back to the God of love, compassion, and righteousness. Charles Octavius Booth spent nearly 50 years in ministry. When he became too weary to carry on due to the Jim Crow South that was um, gaining speed, he moved to Detroit, Michigan, where he later passed in 1924. Booth laid the foundation for others to build upon within the black Christian community. Charles Octavius Booth was a preacher, a teacher, and a theologian. Thank you. Good morning, church. It's awesome to hear about people in history like that, right? Completely humbles me. I'm like, I can barely get up out of bed without falling over in the morning. This guy's starting a whole, uh, writing a whole book. Can everyone please stand as we worship the Lord in song this morning? Uh, we're going to celebrate Valentine's a little bit, uh, remembering our childhood. Um, I think it's a shame our kids don't hear this song enough, but... Uh, <clears throat> Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. ago I thought I would torture the youth by making them sing that song in front of the church and they didn't know the words <laughs> and it reminded me I, I saw a, uh, a video clip this week of a young person a teenager saying are you people who are over 25 okay you know anyone over 25 are you all right out there and I was like was I ever that yes yes I was so it just reminds us right Jesus loves us no matter where we are in our journey <laughs> with him. Amen. <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> sorry, I can't 
I breathe very well. Uh, another love song today. Remember, love lifted me, right? He loves us all so very much. So let's remember that this morning. <clears throat> And knowing deeply that he loves us is what gives us faith in knowing he's doing the right thing for us, right? If you don't believe with every piece of your being that someone has your best interest at heart, you won't listen to what they want you to do. So love, his love for us and our love for him is just the, the, the pinpoint of the faith that we have in him. Amen? Amen. So let's uh, stand up for that. Amen? <clears throat>
I think one of our greatest challenges um, is letting others see Jesus in us, right? Um, love, he challenges us to love everyone. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your enemy. Turn the other cheek. And I think that's so hard um, when we are attacked or we're feeling like we're under attack by others. So uh, this is a great song to remind us that um, the only thing that overcomes that is love, right? Love overcomes everything. When nothing else works, love works. Okay? Yeah. <clears throat> Let others see Jesus in you. <laughs> Good morning again, church. So we are in the middle of a series through the book of James. And one of the things that uh, we've talked about before in terms of the uniquenesses of James is that James is a very practical book. James is, if you will, the Proverbs of the New Testament. He, he's designing this so that you can practically have things to do on a regular basis that will help you live out the Christian life. Now, we come to today's text, and as you hear it, you may think, well, this doesn't exactly seem like a, a short little proverb here. This seems 
like a much longer, bigger theological idea that he's trying to put together. And you would be right, but the reason he spends so much time here is because this is sort of the main crux of where he's trying to go in the letter. If you get this, if you understand this concept and can put it into practice, then all the other things that he brings up will make sense in light of it. So what is this? This is the relationship between what we believe, our faith, and what we do, and getting the connection to that correct. And so I'm going to read this morning for us from the letter to James, of James, uh, chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. So if you have a copy of the scriptures, please feel free to turn there. James chapter 2, 14 through 26. I'll read the whole thing. Uh, we'll pray, and then we'll work our way through it together. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. He was called a friend of God. You see, the person is justified by works and not faith alone. In the same way, was not Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Let's take a moment and pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful this morning for the different ways in which you help us understand connections. Think of Paul's ways of writing about faith and works and their connections and James' way here of writing about it. And you help us see from, from different perspectives what your heart really is for us. And so I pray, Lord, this morning that you would help us to be those who desire to have the type of faith that's alive, the type of faith that's useful, the type of faith that shows Christ in what we do. We pray this, Lord, because we want others to come to faith in Christ, and they will get to know him from what we do. And so we pray you'd help us in that for your name's sake. Amen. <coughs> so this particular passage is one that has really thrown some people off throughout history. Um, because one of the, the key things that a lot of us kind of understand, and we'll talk about it more in a little bit, is the idea that we're saved by faith. And so when James comes along and says, nah, we're justified by works, everybody kind of goes, oh, wait a minute, hold on here. So this is a really important thing to understand, because as I will try to explain as we go through this, the Bible doesn't contradict itself. It's not saying two different things that are opposed to each other. And that is true throughout scripture. You won't find places where the Bible says one thing and then says the exact opposite thing and can't reconcile it. The Bible is a unified whole. So when you read it and you come across something, you go, wait a minute, I don't understand how that makes sense because I read this over here. That's when the study really starts. That's when we really start to dig into the word and go, well, what are they really saying? Why are two people saying things that seem different from each other if they're both having the Holy Spirit inspire them to write something? 
And so we'll, t we'll take a close look here and see what is it James is getting at and why is it so helpful for us in our day and age, in our cultural context. I believe that James is very, very helpful. Start in verse 14. Someone says, so he's kind of doing this idea of, you know, talking as if he's having a conversation with someone else and then answering their questions. So someone says, I have faith, but he doesn't have works. Can that faith save him? <coughs> so here, the key thing to understand is not does faith save him, but does that faith save him? That kind of faith that thinks it can exist without any consequence on its action. The type of faith that says, I believe in God, but it has absolutely no effect on my regular life. Is that the kind of faith that saves people, or is it a false faith? He gives the example here in 15 of someone who's a, a brother or sister. He's not even saying, it, uh, how do you treat outsiders? He's talking even within the context of, of brothers and sisters in Christ. You've got someone that's poorly clothed. They, they don't have what they need. I mean, Today, hey, in Wisconsin, prime example, right? You've got, if you've got somebody who doesn't have a coat when it's 10 below outside and no hat and gloves, they need something. Sending them out of here going, be warm is ridiculous. It doesn't help to say it. You have to do something about it. You need to get them a coat, get them gloves, get them a hat. If they don't have enough to eat, telling them, be filled sounds really nice. Like, I wish you the best at having a full stomach. Now I'm going to go home and eat my cupboard full of food while you try to figure out how to deal with that. And so if my faith is this confidence that God can do anything, he's just not going to use me to do any of it, then that, according to James, would be a, a false faith, a dead faith. It's not the type of faith that it's actually a saving faith in Christ. If faith doesn't have works, verse 17, he says... It's dead. So how do we define what saving faith looks like? Well, I think in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, Paul actually gives us a helpful definition of what really counts when it comes to faith. He says this, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. So your background, whether you're Jewish or a Gentile, didn't matter but only faith working through love. So, so Paul puts this understanding that the, the thing that really matters is a faith that gets stuff done in love. So you can claim you have faith, but the question to ask is, what kind of faith is that? By its nature, saving faith, the type of faith that gets you from here to the eternal presence of Jesus, by nature, it is living and active. By, by, by nature, faith is not dead and inactive. It is living and active. Why? Because it's God who sustains us. God gives us grace to live by faith, and God is alive and active. So he would not give you something that's dead because he's not dead. He wants your faith to be alive and active because he gave it to you and he's living and active. And he's indwelt you with his spirit. So, so if you're a Christian, you have the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. There's no way that the Holy Spirit would want you to just have a, a word of proclaimed faith that's not backed up by a life of it. Because the whole purpose of his presence in you is to transform you into the image of Christ. And Christ was very living and very active. So how do you build your faith up so that it is living and active? I'll take us to the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 12. The word of God is living and active. Sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So if you say to yourself, okay, I want to have an active faith. I want to, I want to have a, a faith that's, that's a saving faith, one that's living and active. What's going to show me if my faith is dying right now or if it's alive and growing? Go to the word of God. 
The word of God will help you sort through your own life and say, is this coming together the way it's supposed to or isn't it? And what's, what's great, I'll, I'll give you a little preview of what you're going to find every time you go through the word of God in light of your own heart. Some of the word of God is going to encourage you and say, yes, you are a child of God and he is at work in you and you can see that. And Christian, every time you go through the word of God, it's also going to convict you. Because every time you go through, it's going to say, yes, you are a child of God, but oh, you could live like it so much more. God's not exhaustible, and so his work in you is not finished yet. Will he ever get there? Oh, yes, he will. He will be faithful and to complete everything that he started in you. There will be a day, the day that's coming, the day of glorification, when all this mess finally gets fixed permanently, right? But until then, every time we read the word of God, it's going to come to us and both say, good job, you're doing well, press on in faith, Oh, and by the way, here's some ways to grow. And if you read the, the, the gospel, if you read the Bible, and it's only telling you one of those two things, you're missing something. And what will happen is you'll either get depressed and assume I can never do enough. I'm never good enough. God doesn't love me. Or you'll come and assume I got this and I don't need anything else because I'm good. And both of those are dangerous places to be. Because you are enough because of what Christ has done for you. That's finished work. And you're becoming everything he wants you to be. And so he's still got more for you. And we live in that tension constantly. So one of the key things in this first part here is you have something to do. Work against dead faith. Strive to be in the word and then living out the word in your life so that the faith that you have is not merely something that you understand in your head, not merely something you feel in your heart, not merely something you say with your lips, but something that you live in your life. Something that has changed not just the things about you, but changed you. So work against having a dead faith and instead one that's living and active. And he makes the point even stronger as he goes into verse 18 and 19. He goes back to talking to this imaginary person again. Someone will say, eh, you have faith, I have works. Maybe we can just separate these two things from another. And he responds and says, show me faith apart from works, and I'll show you faith by works. Okay, so here's what he's setting up. He's saying... Someone would come along and say, you can have one or the other. You don't have to have both. And he says, if you can show me your faith without doing anything, I'm going to show you something better. I'm going to show you something truer. I'm going to show you what faith looks like by what I do. You'll know the type of faith I have when you see how it affects me. And he challenges in one of the strongest ways he can people who would say great things about God without backing it up with what they do. You believe that God is one. You do well. So, okay, I believe that God is one. Hey, I'm even willing to go so far. I believe in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe all sorts of great doctrines. I, I can say the confessional creeds. I'm good. Even the demons believe and shudder. They wait, man. Oh, that's a little strong, isn't it? I mean, they're not out there proclaiming that Jesus is the Son of God or anything, are they? Well, let's take a look at that. Matthew 8, 28 and 29. Jesus has come, met some demon possessed men that were coming out of the tombs. No one could get by them. Verse 29. These demon-possessed men cry out, What do you have to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Even the demons know that Jesus is the Son of God. So you can say great, true, wonderful things. 
But if that doesn't profoundly change your response to who Jesus is, if your heart is not conformed to love the fact that he is the Son of God and be so overwhelmed by that love that it causes you to respond in love to others, you really don't have a whole lot more faith than the demons do. And so we are to not only work against dead faith, we are to work for more than demon faith. It does not mean you don't believe and say gloriously beautiful things about Christ. You do, because they're true. But it can't just stop there. And that's why for so many living out the Christian faith is really where it's at. Because they can say the right things, but their heart doesn't necessarily believe and hasn't necessarily been changed by it. And then he spends the, the last six verses here talking through the idea of what does it look like then to really have faith and works connected correctly. He speaks again to the person he's having this imaginary conversation with and says, do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? So now he's going he's gonna to set it up for him and lay out what it looks like when faith and works come together in a way that's useful. So we're working against dead faith. We're working for more than demon faith. We're working for useful faith. We don't want to be like this person who thinks that faith apart from works is okay. He's going to show us that it's useless, so we want to be useful people. And he brings up the example of Abraham. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. So let's just, let's just stop for a moment and take Abraham and work through this example. Because if we understand what James is saying here, then it'll make a lot more sense with every other situation we come across. So, Abraham, Isaac, review the story in case anybody's not familiar with it. Abraham didn't have kids. God tells him, you're going to have them. You're going to have more than you can ever count. Abraham, okay, I believe you, kind of. He ends up having a child with his wife's servant. But he's told that's not really the child of blessing. And Isaac comes along. And Isaac is supposed to be the beginning of the fulfillment of God's promise. And then God says, take Isaac, go up on a hill, take some wood with you, make an altar, lay him on it, and sacrifice him to me. And Abraham takes Isaac, has him carry the wood, goes up, gets asked, where's the lamb? Don't worry, God will provide. Gets all the way up there, sets out the wood on the altar, ties him down, gets ready with the knife to sacrifice him, and then hears, stop. Don't lay a hand on him. The ram's over here in the thicket. I know now that you, you trust me more than you even trust yourself right now. Take Isaac down, put the ram up, make the sacrifice. Hebrews 11:17 right after the part that we had read earlier says by faith Abraham when he was tested offered up Isaac who he had received who and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son so, so we come to this point where Abraham's been traveling along by faith all the time and now he has to by faith do something that seems unbelievable, and he's willing to do it. 
So James says his works justified him. And he quotes a scripture passage, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. That's a quote from Genesis 15, 6. And he believed the Lord and it was counted to him as righteousness. So, was it his belief in the Lord or was it what he did that justified him? Is James right or not right? Well, let's add something else to confuse the matter a little more here before we sort it all out. Let's go to Paul, because Paul and James are the two that are going to seem the most far apart on this. Romans 4, 1 through 3. Romans 4, 1 through 3, Paul says this. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. So, so James is here saying, you see, Abraham was justified by works. And Paul comes along and says, well, if Abraham was justified by works, and he's got something to boast about, but not before God, because he believed God, and that was credited to him as righteousness. So Paul says it's his belief that got him there, and is James saying it's his work that got him there? And are the two really in conflict with each other here? Would Paul and James get together, and Paul would be like, James, you're wrong on this one. I understand where you want to go here, but you're wrong. Or... Are they talking about something different? Here's where it really comes to a point. Are Paul and James at odds over Abraham? Paul says, you need faith to be justified. James says, works are needed. So do we need works to be saved or not? Two things are key here. Order and purpose. The order and the purpose matter. We are saved by faith, and faith alone. One of, one of the great solas of the Reformation, the onlys of the Reformation, is sola fide, faith alone. That was in contrast to a misunderstanding in the church at, at that time that said, you got saved by doing good stuff. You do enough good, you get saved. You do too much bad, especially certain kinds of bad, you don't get saved. And the Reformation came along and said, no, it's faith alone that saves you. So if that's true, what does that faith look like? Again, back to the beginning part of this. It's a faith that so loves God. It's a faith that so loves him that it can love others too. It's a faith that is too big to keep to yourself. It's a faith that's too big to just stuff into your head and leave it there. It's got to get out somehow. Maybe you've noticed this sometimes. If you, if you eat certain types of food, like you eat a whole lot of garlic or something like that, you, your sweat starts to smell different, right? If you take in enough of Christ, if your faith in him is so full, it has to get out somehow. You're going to sweat it out or work it out somehow. That's the sort of faith alone that saves you. It's a faith that always acts. Faith comes first, though. The order matters. The works matter spring from the presence of faith in you. We have to get the order right. If we don't, we'll end up trying to work our way into heaven. So, to answer the, the title of the sermon, can you work your way into heaven? No, you cannot. And I would even go so far as to argue that there is theoretically the possibility you could have faith without works and get into heaven. How? You could believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved and die at that instant and never have had a chance to live it out in practice. So theoretically, you could technically get to heaven without ever having done a good work. You were saved by your faith alone. 
But if you're sitting here this morning and you're a Christian, then you have faith and time that you're alive. And therefore, your faith should work itself out in some sort of activity. Your faith should be shown in what you do. It should be useful for kingdom purposes. So the order matters. The faith comes first. The faith saves you. And the type of faith that is saving is a faith that works in love. The second thing I said that matters is purpose. So the order matters, but the purpose matters as well. I want you to think and ask yourself this question. Why do I do good things? I don't say it out loud, just think of the answer. Why do I do good things? If your answer begins with the phrase, so that God will, I caution you that you're running down a dangerous path. You don't do good things so that God does something for you. It's not a situation where if I do enough good stuff, then God will do something or God will keep me from something. Right? It's not as if you can say, okay, I don't want cancer, God, so I'm going to go to church every Sunday. We got a deal? It doesn't work that way. You can't do things so that God will do stuff. If your answer begins to the question of why I do good things, because God in Christ has loved me so much that you're probably heading down the right path. If, you're, if, you're, if your answer to why you do good things springs from the amazing love that God in Christ has shown to you, I've seen that, I've experienced that, I know that, and therefore I have to do something in light of that. I'm compelled to, not because I'm trying to get more from God, because I've already received so much from him. So I have to respond, I have to tell someone, I have to help someone, I have to show what Christ is like. And so the things I do almost seem small in comparison to the greatness of love that I've been shown. But regardless of how small it is, I still got to do it. So Paul and James are not at odds. They're speaking to two different struggling people. Because we all struggle in different ways, right? One answer does not fit everybody because we're not all struggling with the same stuff. But both these groups exist within the church consistently throughout history. And our day and age is no exception. So who is Paul speaking to? Paul is challenging the sort of person that thinks God will love them more if they do enough good stuff. And there are people who might not say it that blatantly, but they feel that way. And part of it is understandable. When we do something wrong, the Holy Spirit in us, which, by the way, is way better than like Jiminy Cricket on Pinocchio's shoulder here. It's not just conscience, right? The Holy Spirit in us pricks our conscience in such a way that we feel Horrible that we have distanced ourselves from God by our sin. And God says, repent. Turn away from that. Turn back to me. Be reconciled. And we feel that often because we sin often. And then somehow we get this crazy idea in our head that if that's the case then maybe, in addition to not sinning, I could do some good stuff too, and then instead of just experiencing forgiveness and reconciliation, now I can get in even better with God. I can be like a super Christian, and, and God will love me even more because I did more good stuff. And we take the concept of sin, repentance, and forgiveness and assume that somehow, if we just keep following that idea of doing things that God wants us to do, somehow he'll love us more. 
Paul says, no, it doesn't work that way. Faith saves you. Faith made you right with God. You're a child of his because you believe in Christ. And nothing can change that. And he doesn't lose his people. He's got you. So it is not a matter of whether or not you do enough stuff for God to love you. God loved you enough that he did stuff for you. But James is challenging a different group of people. And oh, these folks are present in the church too. He is challenging the pew warmer. He is challenging the one who thinks because they walked an aisle and hopped into a baptismal, signed a card, they're good. He's challenging the ones who hashtag blessed everything that goes out on social media, but are never seeking to be a blessing to anybody. The ones who say, I believe in Jesus, but their life gives zero evidence that that's true. And as dangerous as it is, if you believe you can work your way into heaven and God will love you more if you do enough stuff, it is equally dangerous to believe that you can say or have done something that marks you as a believer and not have it affect you regularly. And I'll just highlight it because here we are in Baptist Church, we're known for this danger. Because it is very easy to take on the signs of Christianity and not be changed by Christ. What do you got to do? You got to walk down, tell pastor, I want to be a Christian. Okay, let me pray with you. Lord, uh, he wants to be a Christian, so uh, have, make him a Christian. Do you believe you're a Christian? Yeah, I believe I'm a Christian now. Great. Okay, we're done. By the way, that's a horrible prayer. Um, now, what do you got to do next? Oh, oh we've got a baptismal. We'll fill it next week. We'll dunk you. <laughs> Wet, come up, go dry off. Yeah, everybody's happy. And then spend the rest of your life thinking, I said it, I got wet, so I showed it, so I am. And it's so easy to take on external signs without having the internal reality changed. You can have a heart that is not changed even though your mouth can say, I believe in Jesus. And the difference between baptism and getting wet comes down to whether or not you were a believer when you walked into the water. Because if your heart's been changed, then what baptism is is not something that marks you as a believer. It's a declaration that I already am. Which is why in this church, when you go to get baptized, you, you don't get baptized the same day you walk down the aisle. Why? So that we can talk to you and really start to understand where you're at and help you grow and get to the point where you're like, okay, I am confident that I'm a believer. And now I want to be baptized because I want to tell others through that visual display what Christ is doing in and through me. Which, by the way, if that defines you right now, if you're like, yeah, I'm a believer, but I've never been baptized, but man, I'd love to do that, please let me know. We, we will fill that thing up in a hurry because we would love to be able to help you put on display to us and to others that you are his and welcome you in as part of the church family in that sense. So both dangers exist. Paul deals with one, and James deals with the other. So I guess that brings us to the point where you have to ask yourself, where am I struggling the most right now? Where, where's the struggle for me? Is it that I, I need to hear more Paul? I need to hear that my faith is what saves me? That my faith in Christ has what, what made me right with God? And I don't have to earn his love. I just need to rest in it. If you're there, hear Paul. But read James too. You know, read him as well. Understand what he's getting at. Because you've got brothers and sisters in Christ who need to hear that too. And if you got the faith thing down, you're like, yeah, I believe. But hmm, 
And I hear this and I go, have I been sidelining myself for way too long? Like if I was to stand trial in a persecuted country for being a Christian, what would they point to? Hmm. Read James. Read it over again. Pray that God would encourage you with the fact that the living faith that he is putting in your heart will be active in your life. And then look for how he's going to have you live that out. So what's the connection between faith and works? Faith comes first. Faith saves us. But the type of faith that saves us is a faith that works itself out in love. So Christians, those who are believing in Christ, are those whose lives are marked by a phenomenal trust in Christ that allows them to do things that seem impossible even at times because they are so confident in him that nothing can stop them from doing what he's called them to do. And I don't know about you, but that's the sort of body I want to be a part of. That's the sort of church that gets me excited. Because as I see us growing in our ability to love Christ and live that out, not only with each other, but with the world that watches, that just, it's a good thing. It's a great thing. It makes Jesus look fantastic, which I love. And it, it makes me look around at my brothers and sisters and go, oh, if it can be this good with each other now, Man, what's heaven going to be like? That'll be even better when there's no presence of sin and we're all just living the way we should live for Christ all the time. So here's how I'd like us to, to pray before we close. I would like you to personally do some evaluation. Figure out where you're at and pray that God would encourage you even this morning in the way you need encouragement. Maybe you need to pray with your Bible open to Romans 4, 1 through 3. Maybe you need to pray with your Bible open to James 2, 14 through 26. But pray. And then I want you to pray for the rest of the body. The ones that are here, the ones that are at home. Pray that as we go through the Christian life together, we would be those who are marked by a powerfully loving, working, active faith. Pray for the effectiveness of our faith in the lives of those around us. So let's take a few minutes and pray for that, and uh, Catherine will play, and then I'll close us in prayer. And then uh, Carlina, are you going to come lead us in a closing song as well? Great.
Heavenly Father, I pray that you would give us faith, but not generic dead faith. That you would give us the kind of faith that shows that you've saved us. The kind of faith that lives itself out in the world in powerful ways. Lord, help us to trust you more fully. Grow our faith that our works could be even stronger because our confidence is you, in you is even greater. Lord, I pray for our church that you would allow us the privilege and the joy of seeing through what we do, through our faith put on display, more and more people in our neighborhood and the nations come to, like us, not just declare Christ as Lord, but to live as those transformed by him. Lord, we ask these things for your glory and for our joy in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with me as we sing the parting song. And I'll apologize in advance because um, I didn't know this song, but I read the words and it was just so gorgeous. And I thought the words worked so well for this Sunday. Um, so I think it'll be easy to learn, but uh, maybe just focus on the words. <laughs> okay. and love.